The Daily Signal is the multimedia news organization of the Heritage Foundation. It's a place where busy Americans can come, find out what the important issues of the day are, to cut through the clutter and communicate directly to the American people, and be exposed to conservative policy solutions. The American people are a lot smarter than the news gives them the credit for. They know the difference between spin and news. We work with 100 policy experts here at the Heritage Foundation who cover a range of issues. What makes The Daily Signal unique is our commitment to delivering the news in a fair, accurate, and trustworthy manner. Since The Daily Signal began, we have gone where the action is. That meant sending a team to the U.S.-Mexico border. Reporting from Encina, Texas, this is Josh Siegel with The Daily Signal. It meant going to the steps of the Supreme Court as decisions were being handed down. Right now, we're here at the Supreme Court, where it's just decided whether... And we've worked with veteran investigative reporter Cheryl Atkinson. I have far more editorial freedom contributing the stories that I do to Daily Signal than I had the last couple of years in my professional job at what most people consider a fair organization. Why did we start The Daily Signal? The media landscape is constantly changing, and we want to be on the cutting edge. They've been willing to let the stories tell themselves and go in whatever direction the stories go. It's not a question of whether we can drive the media narrative. It's only a question of whether we have the courage to capitalize on the opportunity that's right in front of us. That is what The Daily Signal is. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President of the Media Research Center, and Chairman of For America, Brent Bozell. Good morning, CPAC. Let me first thank all the organizers of CPAC this year. I think they've done a terrific job. What do you think? Let, let me get right to my talk. Something happened last summer where most people weren't looking. The Democrats quietly introduced Senate Joint Resolution 19 to amend the First Amendment. Had it passed, it would have given Congress incredible new powers to limit political and, and public policy speech. It would have given the Congress the power to regulate, even to prohibit movies even television shows of a political nature that might influence elections. Books deemed too political could be banned, as might be political editorials in newspapers. MSNBC, CNN, Fox, all have political com commentary. That might be construed as a corporate contribution and might have been forbidden as well. What about fly flyers distributed in parking lots? Bumper stickers, all are forms of communication all theoretically could have been controlled by the state. This unthinkable outrage didn't pass, but something else didn't pass either. Senator Ted Cruz offered his solution, the First Amendment. Every single Democrat on the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee voted against it. Something terrible is happening to our country. The radical left now controls most levers of political and cultural power and is using both in a relentless campaign to destroy the last vestiges of freedom in America. Tyranny is knocking at our door. Consider, Lois Lerner and who knows what other officials in the Obama administration illegally used the IRS, the most feared arm of the federal government, to harass, persecute, and even prosecute conservatives. They were illegally coordinating these illegal activities with the Department of Justice, the FEC, and who knows what other agencies. To cover up evidence, they destroyed government property. They lied at the White House, and they committed perjury on Capitol Hill. Watergate was a political paper cup by comparison. The radicals have shown their fangs. They will do anything, using any means at their disposal, legal or otherwise, to control our very freedom of speech. Ponder this carefully. When the state uses its power to destroy any political opposition, spying on and silencing through threats and criminal, criminal prosecution, is it all that different from the East German Stasi? Talk radio is arguably the strongest weapon in the conservative arsenal, so the radicals want it destroyed. They first tried to revive the Fairness Doctrine, which if enacted, would de facto have put this industry out of business. When that effort was derailed, they returned with localism, which Rush correctly labeled as the backdoor to the Fairness Doctrine. 
The radicals now control the Federal Communications Commission and the FCC is out of control in its zeal to control free speech. The North Koreans would approve of this. Last summer, it was making quiet preparations to put a federal monitor in every newsroom to assess stations' news philosophy and the process by which stories are selected. This shocking abuse of governmental authority was exposed and stopped, but by no means have the radicals stopped. As I speak these words, the Obama administration is making its play for the internet. It's quietly working to have a federal takeover of the infrastructure of delivering the internet. Through net neutrality, it's giving government control of the internet, forcing it to comply by federal regulations. But perhaps most disturbing and underreported is this. The radicals want political speech on the internet to be declared political activity. As such, through yet another abusive arm of government, this time the Federal Elections Commission, the federal government would actually decide what is and isn't acceptable as free speech on the internet in the United States of America. Now, if government fiat, government by fiat doesn't work, there are other ways for them to achieve results. They go personal. The radicals have set their sights on corporate America to silence it with a campaign of relentless personal harassment. The founder of Mozilla donated $1,000 to, to a campaign to preserve the definition of marriage. In turn, left-wing agitators declared Brendan Eich and Mozilla to be haters. The leftist news media dutifully amplified the smear, and in short order, Ike was forced out of his own company for supporting marriage. Dan Cathy of Chick-fil-A is another Christian who also publicly defended traditional marriage. They tried to brand him a hater too and would have succeeded had not the pro-life movement risen to his defense. Political groups are regularly targeted. The American Legislative Exchange Council developed model legislation for the Stand Your Ground policy. Then Trayvon Martin was killed. The radicals saw the opportunity and they pounced. They threatened to associate Alex's corporate donors with the policies that they declared had resulted in murder. In short order, it worked. The suits at Wendy's, Crafts, McDonald's, Pepsi-Cola, Coca-Cola, among others, canceled their support and headed for the tall grass. Character assassination is a powerful weapon for a ruthless movement without honor. Ask Rush Limbaugh. The radicals know that if they can scare off enough advertisers, they can knock him off the air. Then it's only a matter of time before all conservative talk radio is canceled by the nervous Nelly station managers. But how to do it? Their dishonesty, time and again, astonishes. In 2007, they declared that Rush had labeled as phony soldiers any Iraqi war veterans who opposed the war. It was a blatant lie. Yet dozens of liberal leaders rose to repeat that falsehood. After a grueling struggle, Rush exposed and humiliated his foes. But it did not deter them, and nothing will, so long as ends justify the means. Last September, they were back, again with the parsing, again with the selective editing, again with the character assassination. Now they accused him of condoning violence. This time, they deployed a new tactic, unleashing hundreds of thousands of tweets, mercilessly pounding his advertisers, in a campaign of, she of sheer intimidation. It ended when Rush conducted his own investigation and discovered it was no more than, are you ready? 11 members of the Underwear Brigade using false identities and advanced technical, uh, digital technology to project a national outrage that was as fabricated as the accusation. The radicals have set their sights on silencing con cultural conservatives in Hollywood. Brothers David and Justin Bainham, uh, Bainham we're set to launch a new series on the HGTV network. Then David made a fatal mistake during a radio interview. In Leviticus, it says that death is the consequence for homosexual sin, he said. However, Jesus came and took the consequences of that sin upon himself on the cross. He had quoted scripture. The radical left has its own church and its own dogma, and this was a mortal sin. How dare you allow Christian hate mongers on your network, they thundered to HGTV, which dutifully, spinelessly capitulated and canceled the show. The Star of Duck Dynasty, who will be gracing this stage later this morning, 
made similar public statements about his Christian faith. Same leftist assault, but it, I guess it pays to be the star of the most popular cable show on television. Phil Robertson's millions of fans exploded, and after a brief obnoxious suspension, he was reinstated. Hollywood, what hypocrisy. No industry more emphatically preaches tolerance while practicing a more strident form of censorship. Conservatives walk on eggshells, knowing their very careers are imperiled for endorsing a conservative position. Friends of Abe's was formed several years ago to espouse libertarian beliefs within Hollywood. Some members' names have been made public. Kramer, Sinise, Voigt, dozens, maybe hundreds of others remain anonymous for fear of retaliation. The radicals have set their sights on academia, silencing conservative voices all over America. In a recent survey of 409 universities, 62% now have restrictive codes or policies that serve to stifle free speech. At Vanderbilt University, a Christian news application to organize on campus was deferred because its rules stated a member must hold Christian beliefs. At the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, a Christian student group came under fire from the administration because it dismissed a student from its ranks who wasn't a Christian. At the University of Mary Washington, the student newspaper was forced to drop its name, The Bullet, because it propagated violence. At Drake University, conservative student newspapers were vandalized and hundreds of issues destroyed. What sin had they committed? This paper had featured a pro-life ad. At the University of Ma uh, at Massachusetts in Amherst, the conservative student paper was stolen. When conservative students protested, the university responded as only a university from Massachusetts would. The conservative paper was banned from campus. At the University of, uh, university of Minnesota Morris, a professor encouraged students to destroy all copies of the conservative papers. At Oregon State, the university had to pay $101,000 in legal fees after university officials admitted they junked conservative papers. At the University of California, two sweet, petite high school girls, pro-life, were physically attacked by a thuggish professor with their pro-life signs destroyed while the professor and her aides taunted them. It is no hyperbole to say that on many college campuses, conservatives live in fear. The radicals have set their sights on Christianity itself. The New Mexico Human Rights Commission levied a $6,600 fine against a woman after she declined to photograph a lesbian commitment ceremony. In Oregon, the owners of a Christian bakery refused to make a wedding cake for a lesbian couple and are facing fines in excess of $150,000. In Idaho, two Christian ministers who own a wedding chapel were ordered to perform uh, same-sex weddings or face jail time, potentially more than three years, as well as a $1,000 fine for each day of noncompliance. In Houston, the outspoken lesbian mayor ordered city attorneys to issue subpoenas to local pastors demanding they surrender any speeches, writings, or sermons on gender identity, homosexuality, or even simply mentioning her. Liberals like Reverend Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, and Jeremiah Wright have preached left-wing politics from the pulpit for decades. But when conservative pastors tried to do this through Pulpit Freedom Sunday, look what happened. The radical atheist group Freedom From Religion Foundation sued. Not the pastors, mind you, but the IRS for not adequately prosecuting the pastors. The IRS dutifully acquiesced, and as part of the settlement, the IRS agreed to monitor church sermons for political content. Some Christian leaders now require bodyguards for their protection. In America, the website of the radical group Southern Poverty Law Center includes what it calls a hate map, pinpointing the geographic locations of pro-family organizations. A leftist gay militant who visited that site decided to attack the Family Research Council for its support of Chick-fil-A. He entered the lobby, pulled out a gun, and shot FRC's security guard, who, though severely wounded, managed to disarm him. The shooter was carrying a bag filled with Chick-fil-A sandwiches. He admitted he intended to kill as many FRC employees possible and then place a sandwich next to the body of each victim. The radicals are attempting to rewrite history. In Seattle, Columbus, in Seattle, Columbus Day has been officially canceled and replaced with Indigenous Peoples Day. In Denver, troublemakers that move on organized massive protests against school board members 
for promoting patriotism in the public school. History books are being rewritten to erase America's grounding in the Judeo-Christian ethic, America's role as leader of the free world, and the very idea of American exceptionalism. The Reagan tax cuts caused the Reagan deficits. His disdain for homosexuals resulted in the AIDS epidemic. And as for Reagan ending the Cold War, what pure nonsense. Strope Talbot was Bill Clinton's ambassador to the Soviet Union. He declared this, Gorbachev is helping the West by showing that the Soviet threat isn't what it used to be, and what's more, that it never was. Through the Common Core program, they're teaching children that George Washington was no different than Palestinian terrorists, and Thomas Jefferson should be defined as a hypocrite for writing the Declaration of Independence while he owned slaves. It labels those who fought in the Revolutionary War American mobs, and states the Boston Tea Party was far too radical for some. It asks this question, if a Palestinian suicide bomber kills several dozen Israeli teenagers in, an, in a Jerusalem restaurant, is that an act of terrorism or wartime retaliation against Israeli government policies and army actions? David Roberts writes for the radical left-wing blog Grist. He doesn't much care for conservatives who question global warming. When we finally gotten serious about global warming, he writes, we should have war crimes for these bastards, some form of Nuremberg. It's come to this. There's only one scientific position that's permissible in the climate debate. There's only one morally acceptable position on gay rights. Freedom is oppression, free enterprise is confiscatory, morality is immorality, and the Washington Redskins is hate speech. Censorship is everywhere. We can no longer trust God in our coins, pray in our schools, or keep a crucifix uncovered when the president is speaking in front of it. Our beliefs are no longer insensitive, they're offensive. And what's offensive is hateful, and what is hateful should be criminalized. Do not believe I exaggerate. A national survey shows that 51% of Democrats now support that. Webster defines fascism as a tendency toward or actual exercise in strong autocratic or dictatorial control. Cultural fascism has arrived in America. Let us understand this soberly and unequivocally. Ladies and gentlemen, we know this to be true. So it begs the question, what is our response? Is it to surrender to the fascists, perhaps only gradually, certainly grudgingly, but ultimately surrender nonetheless? We've been retreating for decades. Do we accept a new reality of a transformed society where freedom is an ever more distant memory? Is that your gift to your progeny? After so many millions of men and women gave of their blood and their very lives to give you the gift of the freest society in the history of man. No, by God, tell me it's not. I do not ask you to defend yourself well and retreat. I ask you to stop the retreat turn around and face the sound of the guns. It's time for us to be intolerant. It's time to stop tolerating and remove from office those men and women of either political party who will not fight boldly and unequivocally to restore freedom. It's time to stop tolerating those who believe government is by and for the thousands of lobbyists and professional consultants prowling the halls of government and feasting on our liberties like rats. Do not tolerate fascists in academia. It's so easy to end that scourge. Drain the swamp. Stop sending your children and your money to these indoctrination camps. Do not tolerate the censors. Do not tolerate the censors in the news or entertainment media. Give voice to your, to your beliefs loudly, cheerfully, proudly, defiantly. Watch America embrace you. Do not tolerate the attacks on conservative leaders. Take to the rooftops and champion them. Look for every opportunity to be politically correct. Drive those radicals crazy. Make a vow this December, everywhere you go, with everyone you meet, it will not be a happy holiday. It will be Merry Christmas. We have weapons, we have weapons. We can communicate with millions of Americans through the power of technology. Use those weapons, tell your story, 
tell our story. Tell them what America once was, what America should be, and what America will be. Our founders will be vindicated. Your progeny will be grateful. And the Almighty, I think you'll be well pleased. May God bless you. May God bless America.